Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Peter Lawford in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents part one of the first detective novel ever written. A tale considered by many to be the greatest ever written. Wilkie Collins, The Moonstone. Our star, Mr. Peter Lawford. Last call. Last call. Last call for what, Harlow? Why, last call for that winter car check, Hap. Not much more time to get the oil and grease changed, put in antifreeze. And check those important spark plugs, too. You said it, Johnny Plug Check. The spark plugs are the very heart of a car's ignition system. They've got to be right for quick, cold weather start. So have them checked by your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer. He's an expert on cleaning and adjustment. But suppose those spark plugs are worn out, Harlow. Why then, Hap, your Autolite spark plug dealer will heartily and happily suggest a set of world-famous Autolite spark plugs. Like the amazing Double Life Resistor Spark Plug. So get those spark plugs checked tomorrow, and you'll avoid cold weather sorrow. And do it at your Autolite spark plug dealer. To quickly locate him, phone Western Union by number and ask for operator 25. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents part one of Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone, starring Mr. Peter Lawford. Hoping once again to keep you in suspense. Not my boy. There's the house. Silence, boy. My eyes behold. Have you chosen the place, my brother? Beneath these trees, my brother, are we observed? No. Begin it. Boy, look to my eyes. Please, not again. Please don't miss me. Look to my eyes. Yes, my lord. In the name of the regent of the night, lord of the world, whose arms embrace the four corners of earth, your servants, O Lord, dedicated to end the vile sacrilege of unbelievers, dedicated to restore what is rightfully yours, use this body we offer you. Give us the power of your sight. See the Englishman who has returned from foreign parts. I Is it to this house and no other he will travel today? To this house and no other. And he brings it with him? Yes, he brings it. And as the sun sets, he will enter the house? I, I can't see. See, tell us. Rises in my head. I can't see. This is enough, my brother. He will come. And he will bring the moonstone. It was in May of 1848 that I received news of the death of my uncle, Colonel John Herncastle. The letter caught up to me in Italy with instructions that I return to England and perform my duties as executor of my uncle's will. Not having seen my uncle since childhood, I felt neither one way or the other about his death. But I remembered the story. A black sheep with a strong dash of savage. He had fought in India and come home with a vile reputation which had closed the doors of all his relations against him. His sister, Lady Julia Verinda, had taken the lead in this respect. Colonel John never set foot in her great Yorkshire house. Naturally, this all went through my mind as I entered the office of our family lawyer, Mr. Matthew Brough. Well, 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 Mr. Franklin Blake. You're looking fit, quite fit. 
Thank you, sir. You're looking well yourself. Let's see now. How many years has it been? Oh, five at least, sir. Five. My, my, my. How time flies. Well, sir, now, this letter of Colonel Herncastle's will. You're acquainted with your duties? Yes, sir. I've signed papers, and there's a birthday gift left to my cousin Rachel Brenda. I'm to take it to her. Very good, sir. Now to work. The first clause provides for support and safekeeping for his animals. Cats and dogs and horses he seemed to prefer for human company. This paper covers that. You uh, sign here. All right, sir. Second clause directs his fortune to be used wholly for the establishment of a professorship of chemistry at Cameron University. Rumors were the colonel was addicted to opium. I suppose that explains the chemistry. Sign here. Yes, I've heard he took drugs. The third clause you might as well read yourself. Read from uh, here. Right. Thirdly and lastly, I give and bequeath to my niece, Rachel Verinda, only child of my sister, Lady Julia Verinda, the yellow diamond belonging to me and known in the East as the Moonstone. Mr. Braff, a diamond? Hmm? Uh, oh, yes. There's a diamond, all right. Read on. Hmm. That said diamond should be given to my niece, Rachel, on her first birthday after my death, subject to the condition that her mother, Lady Verinda, be living at the time, and that my diamond be given into the hands of my niece by my nephew, Franklin Blake, in the presence of my sister, the said Julia Verinda. This I do in free forgiveness of my sister's conduct in closing her doors to me and publicly injuring my reputation as an officer and a gentleman during my lifetime. And the most generous forgiveness it turned out to be. The wicked colonel's diamond. Do you have it here? No, no, the bank. Been in the bank vault for years. At one time, the colonel hinted of a conspiracy against him, claimed the stone was some sort of sacred Indian jewel, part of a four-handed moon god, which to any serious person sounds like drug addiction. Is this moonstone really worth it? We've had three appraisals. Of course, quite a stir of size and color. There's a flaw. But the least value put on the stone is 30,000 pounds. 30,000? What the old dog. There was also a paper instructing that if he died mysteriously, uh, which he did not, the jewel was to be sent secretly to a diamond cutter in Amsterdam and cut up into several smaller stones. That way he thought to destroy its identity. Strange. The colonel knew its worth. Why? Nothing strange, sir, when it comes to drugs. When will you be leaving for Yorkshire, Mr. Blake? And tomorrow afternoon. Lady Julia's invited me down to stay for two weeks before the birthday. You'll carry 30,000 pounds. Take care, my boy. I shall, Mr. Brown. You know, somehow I wish that I'd seen more of the count. Heaven no, sir. God bless him so. But he was truly a wretched man. Goodbye, Mr. Blake. My regards to Lady Belinda, Miss Rachel. Bye, sir. Early the next morning, I went to the bank, presented my authorization, and was led to the strong room. I unlocked the family vault and saw a little wooden box. I slid open the cover and nestled in cotton with the stone. Even in that dim light, there streamed a burst like the harvest moon. It drew my eyes into a yellow deep as unfathomable as the heavens themselves. A strange, eerie feeling began to grip me. Almost hypnotic. I had to force myself to close the lid. I put the box carefully in an inside pocket, left the bank and plunged into the street crowd, reaching the station just in time. Towards noon, I arrived at the quiet country town of Frisingle, feeling almost my natural self. For two weeks, the Moonstone was going to be my responsibility, and I prudently decided to place it in the local bank. I then hired a carriage and was driven out to the great Verinda house sitting high on the Yorkshire coast near the sea. The place had practically been a second home in my youth, and I felt a warm, comfortable sense of return. Franklin, sir. Won't you come in, please? 
My lady and Miss Rachel are off, sir. We weren't expecting you till this evening. I had a sudden change in plans. I hope it's no bother. Oh, no bother, sir. Only my father, he was so looking forward to meeting you at the station. Your father? Betridge, sir. The family steward. Oh, good old Betridge, of course. So you're his daughter. Well, you were just a bet. Where is he? Down the beach walk, sir. The place they call Shivering Sand. He went to fetch one of the maids to lunch. That ugly place? I'll, I'll surprise him. Oh, Mr. Franklin, pardon, sir, but do you know any traveling jugglers? What? Indian jugglers, sir. They came to the house to show us their tricks. I overheard them talking about a gentleman from foreign parts coming here, and you're just back from the continent. His father drove them off because he thought they had snakes. No. No, I don't know any jugglers. Please excuse me, sir. Father said it was silly. Excuse me. The beach walk led to one of the ugliest little bays on the Yorkshire coast. It was quicksand. At the turn of the tide, the whole face shivered and trembled in a most gruesome manner. Rounding the dunes, I saw two figures watching the tide. A woman and the plump, friendly form of old Betridge. Why do you visit this horrid place? I'm drawn to it, Mr. Betridge. Something draws me. Sand. Betridge! What? Uh, who is it? Don't you recognize me? Why, Lord, this is Mr. Franklin. How are you, Betridge? Our fine boy, all grown to a man. Uh, Rosanna, this is our Mr. Franklin. Yes, I, I know Mr. Franklin. You know me? Yes, sir. From your pictures in the house. Excuse me. Please excuse me. Well, that's an odd girl. Uh, Rosanna's our newest maid. Sir. She's a bit strange. Mark it down to that. I must say, you're looking the pink, sir. Thank you. Uh, tell me something, Betridge. Anything, sir. What? About the Indian jugglers who were here. I met your daughter. Edgar, <laughs> if Penelope's bothered you, sir, I'll... No, no, not at all. Just tell me, what did they do? Nothing, sir. You know how women are. She was down by our front trees and heard some of their rigmarole, asking a boy they had about a gentleman from foreign parts and did he have it about him. That's all, sir. Sick. I see. Something wrong, sir? No. No, not really, I'm sure. Come along. Perhaps it was silly. A conjure trick. But I felt rather clever for having put the diamond back in a bank. Still, it had to be coincidence, and reaching the house, I resolved to keep my imaginings to myself. Lady Julia and Rachel weren't expected home for sundown, so I went to my room to unpack. I lay down on the bed to rest, and I must have dozed off. For when I opened my eyes, it was dark. Who's there? <gasps> Me, sir. Rosanna. Oh, what are you doing? Just coming to wake you, sir. It's near dinner. Good Lord, I haven't even unpacked. Oh, I did it while you slept, sir. It's the dinner bell. Last. I haven't got time to change. How do I look? Oh, ever so elegant, Mr. Franklin. Thank you, Rosanna. Thank you. Yes. Lady Julia. Franklin, dear boy, so good to have you back. Oh, it's good to be back, Lady Julia. You look exactly the same. Oh, you're kind, Franklin. But you, I don't think I'd have recognized you. I would. I would have recognized you, Cousin Franklin. Rachel, dear. This is Rachel? This is Rachel. The little girl whose hair you so delighted in pulling and put frogs down her back. And got kicked in the shins for it. <laughs> I can't believe it. That you did those things? Why, Cousin Franklin. Well, no, I... Well, I mean you... Well, you're beautiful. Really, sir? Thank you, sir. And you've grown handsome. Now we're even. Rachel? Now come to dinner, you two. Franklin, you must tell us all about the continent. And there it began. Rachel was undoubtedly the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. I couldn't take my eyes off. 
In the days that followed, I found myself trying to spend every waking moment with her. Recalling our days as children. Walking, riding. <laughs> I even thought of bird watching. By the second week, I was very deeply in love. Franklin! Where are you? In here, my sitting room. Well, what on earth is... I'm painting. This door needed doing, so I'm doing it. I know, but cupids and birds... There. All done. Now, now don't smudge it. It's wet. This one's supposed to be you. What do you think? Well, it's not quite my nose. Uh, who's this fancy one here? Oh, that's Godfrey Eberwhite. Cousin Godfrey. Don't you remember him? Mm, dashing Godfrey. Oh, yes. The ladies' man. Works with women's committees or something, doesn't he? He'll be here for the party tonight. All the Able Whites. Party? Franklin, today's my birthday. Oh, good Lord, Rachel. Stupid. I'd... Happy birthday. Thank you, sir. I'm dying to know what it is. What? With the black sheep colonel's gift. Mother said it wouldn't be anything nice. Well, you did bring it. Yes, yes. Rachel, what time is it? Almost four. I've got to do something. There's just time. Not having mind for anything but Rachel, I'd even forgotten the day. I rode full speed to Frenzingall, took the diamond from the bank, and returned all dust and lather. I bathed, hopped into my party clothes, and made it downstairs just as the first guests arrived. <laughs> the Ablewhites. Mr. and Mrs., twin daughters, and ladies committee man Godfrey. Cousin Franklin, lovely to see you. Oh, pardon me, cousin, there's Rachel. Lovely to see you. He went to Rachel and very neatly monopolized her attentions. The rest of the guests arrived, and then, thank heaven, it was time to open the presents. From the late Colonel Herncastle, a box. No, Rachel, oh. not that first. Oh, don't be silly, Mother, it won't bite. Oh. Oh, my, look. Just look. Oh. Exquisite. It's simply exquisite. Mother, look at it. No. Put it down, Rachel. It means no good. I looked at Lady Julia. Her eyes, set in an ash-white face, were riveted on the diamond. She quickly recovered her composure, but underneath I saw the same uneasiness I too had felt when I first saw the moonstone. Then I knew why the colonel's gesture of forgiveness had left the diamond to Rachel. She was fascinated, but Lady Julia was repelled. She could have thrown it as far as she could. Oh, look, everyone. Out on the terrace. The whole party turned. Standing on the terrace were two Indian jugglers. And a boy. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Peter Lawford in Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone, tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Harlow, who is this Johnny Plug check, anyway? Well, you might call him the motorist's conscience, Hap. He's here to remind us to beat winter by having the oil and grease changed, putting in antifreeze... And the most important thing to do is check those spark plugs, too. You sure should. The spark plugs are the heart of a car's ignition system. When they're right, your chances of starting every time are better than ever. So have your spark plugs checked. If replacements are needed, your Autolite spark plug dealer will recommend Autolite spark plugs, like the Double Life Resistor spark plug that gives you smoother performance. And the resistor spark plug is only one of a complete line of Autolite spark plugs, ignition engineered for every use. So, before winter hits hard... Check those important spark plugs. Don't delay. You should have done it yesterday. Yes, see your Autolite spark plug dealer, because from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Peter Lawford in Elliot Lewis's production of Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone, a tale well calculated to keep you in 
Suspense. As if from nowhere, the Indians appeared on the terrace. The party streamed out to watch them. They were doing some ridiculously simple tricks and not doing them too well. Rachel was standing quite near them. I went to her quickly. Where on earth did they come from? Rachel, where's the diamond? Right here in my hand, see? Don't hold it up like that. Well, they've stopped. Is that all? All right, you fellows. Here's money. Now, now be off with you. Thank you, sir. Me, thanks, sir. Well, really, there wasn't very much to it, was there? They picked up the money, not at all eagerly, and went off down the drive. There was only one thing to draw from it. What the colonel believed of the moonstone was true. It was not forgiveness, but his vengeance. And I had been the instrument to put it in Rachel's hands. The dinner was quite gay, except for Lady Julia, who seemed very solemn, and myself. The talk turned around the diamond, Cousin Godfrey leading the abominable joke. <laughs> <laughs> After all, it's only carbon, you know, just carbon. <laughs> we should heat it over a fire, Miss Rachel, expose it to a current of air, and uh, poof, no more anxiety about its safekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not funny, Mr. Blake? No, Dr. Candy, it didn't strike me. I suspect you haven't been sleeping well. Uh, You should let me give you a course in medicine. In my opinion, Dr. Candy, your course in medicine and groping in the dark are one and the same thing. Ah, but you're groping for sleep, sir. I could help. I've heard of the blind leading the blind, Doctor. Now I know what it means. (laughs) No, no, really, sir. If I may say... Ladies, please. Shall we continue in the drawing room? Betty. Brandy and soda for the gentlemen. We adjourned to the first note of the seasonal rainstorm. I hoped to reach Rachel, but Cousin Godfrey made his move quicker and was already swarming over this charm. (laughs) He was staying the night, and since I felt a great urge to kick him, I prudently kept to myself. The approaching storm prodded the guests home early before the roads turned to mud. Dr. Candy was the last to leave. Well, storm's the least of my worries. A doctor's skin is waterproof, you know. (laughs) Well, good night, Mr. Blake. Good night, Doctor. Uh, If you're trouble sleeping tonight, uh, try a brandy and soda. Good night. Good Good night. Good night. Well, that's that. I think I'll bid you all good night myself. No, not yet, Rachel. Oh, no, not yet. Rachel, where are you going to keep the diamond? The cabinet in my sitting room. My dear, but it has no lock on it. <gasps> Mother, is this a hotel? We've no thieves. I want you to come to my room, Rachel, first thing in the morning. Yes, Mother. Good night, Godfrey. Good night, Cousin Rachel. See you early. Rachel, may I see you up? Please do, Franklin. What were you and Godfrey... Talking about? He proposed to me. You're not going to. I love you, Rachel. A little more time, Franklin, please. The diamond, I've got to tell you. I'll put it right in my cabinet. Good night. Everything all right, sir? Yes, thank you, Betridge. There's a brandy and soda nightcap at your bedside, sir. Good night. Good night. Mr. Franklin, Mr. Franklin, wake up, sir. Please wake up. Mm. What? Betches, morning already? Yes, sir. Something terrible's happened, sir. Rachel. Uh, she's all right. The diamond, it's gone. Get my robe. Thanks. Come on. 
How did they break in, Betridge? Who, sir? Those blasted jugglers, of course. I've been all over the house, sir. It's still locked up tight. Don't worry, cousin, please. Rachel, don't, be safe. don't to talk. No, I don't want to talk. I won't. Lady Julia, how is Rachel? Is she... How else? She's upset, cousin. You won't Thoroughly. talk about it, Franklin, even to me. I'll go for the police. Betridge, saddle a horse. The fastest you've got. I dashed to my room, dressed quickly, and got outside just as Betridge moved, arrived with a horse. I rode full gallop, furious with myself for not having spoken up about the engines. I was only thankful they hadn't touched Rachel. Reaching the police at Trinsingle, I rushed in and received the shock of my life. Are those your jugglers, Mr. Blake? Sir. Yes. Yes, those are the ones, all right. Ah, there was a fuss at the tavern. The three of them, according to the record, have been here in jail since 11 last night. From what you tell me, this moonstone was still in the owner's possession at 11. These men couldn't have taken it. I saw the record with my own eyes. It was impossible. If not the Indians, who? Almost a year was to pass before the discovery of the truth. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Peter Lawford. In part one of Wilkie Collins, The Moonstone. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite, the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. In 28 plants from coast to coast, Autolite makes over 400 products for cars, trucks, tractors, planes, boats, and industry. These products include bumpers, die castings, and batteries, such as the famous Autolite Stay Full, Ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, both standard and resistor types. Voltage regulators, wire and battery cable, Autolite bullseye sealed beam units, and Autolite original service parts for all Autolite electrical systems. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. So, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next week, the concluding portion of the first detective novel ever written. The Discovery of the Truth, part two of Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone. Our star, Mr. Peter Lawford. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone was adapted for Suspense by Richard Chandley. In tonight's story, Ellen Morgan was heard as Rachel. Featured in the cast were Betty Harford, William John Stone, Ben Wright, Herb Butterfield, Pat Hitchcock, Norma Varden, Eric Snowden, Alistair Duncan, and Dick Beale. Peter Lawford will soon be seen co-starring in the Columbia picture, It Should Happen to You. And remember, next week, Mr. Peter Lawford in the concluding portion of Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone. You can buy Autolite standard or resistor type spark plugs, Autolite original service parts, and Autolite stay full batteries neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network.